Hello, Yes But Why listeners. This is your host, Amy Jordan. Welcome to Yes But Why, episode 244, my chat with Jessica Thonin. But first, let's chat about our sponsors. Today's episode is sponsored by Audible. Get your free audiobook download and your 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why. You know, signing up for Audible has honestly been one of the best things I've done for myself during this whole pandemic. With the kiddo constantly in tow, I don't get much time to myself. Even when I do, I'm usually exhausted. Audible gives me refuge for a moment to be transported to another world. Go now to audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why to download the app and sign up to get your free audiobook today. You deserve it. Another sponsor for today's episode is podcastcadet.com. Podcast Cadet is a community of educators ready and waiting to answer your podcasting questions. Whatever podcasting question you might have, Podcast Cadet can help you out. Use code YBY20 to get 20% off the first service or workshop you buy. This week on Yes But Why, we chat with theatrical design and technology professor Jessica Thonin. Jessica and I are friends from way back. She got me my first big deal theater gig after college. In our conversation, we chat about building props for summer stock, touring the world with Door the Explorer, and building community at Eckerd College. Tune in as we reminisce about our New York City apartment and all the glittery resumes we've sent out over the years. I now present to you Yes But Why, Episode 244, Jessica Thonin and the Magical Flow of Possibility. Enjoy! Amy Jordan, and this is Yes, But Why Podcast. Yeah. So it was the spring of my sophomore year, and sort of the, the famous story, but, but now I go, I cannot believe my sort of advisors at the time told the story this way, but the way that they told the story was this is, ah, yes. Um, I met Jessica on her boss's bed at a party. Like that's inappropriate. Can we just call that out? That is inappropriate because it was intentionally salacious. Went all right over my head. I had no idea. I was like, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? But nonetheless, I met um, someone from uh, a summer stock company, at a like cast party after a show at um, Mississippi University for Women, where I was at the time, and I ended up going to work that summer at like my first summer stock. And for me, a girl who grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana, in a fairly conservative background, and then moved to Mississippi, another fairly conservative background and then went to school in Mississippi, I was delightedly shocked when I got to Summerstock. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, I had no idea until that moment what I had been feeling my whole life was that there was no one else like me, right? Like I just felt like, I guess this is just what it feels like to be a human on the planet, to have no one else in <laughs> It feels like they have a similar kind of point of view on life. I guess I'll just keep it down. But then I went to summer stock, stock and it was like, I don't want to say it was like just everything was wild and out. But compared to what I had lived before, it felt really majorly wild and out. And I loved it. And, and I don't mean like behavior wise, right? I mean, just this invitation to play all the time. Like, we could make funny voices all the time, and nobody was going, why are you doing that? You know, and we could just have crazy little um, ideas about fantasies about the day, and, and I loved it. And I went to a payphone and called my dad, and I was like, Dad, I've got two things to tell you. Um, one is I know it's a lot to take, but I don't want to go back to school in the fall. 
and I, I really did hear him swallow over the phone. And then, um, and then I said, and I don't think I want to be a teacher. Joke's on me. But at the time, I thought <laughs> I didn't want to be a teacher. <laughs> but I kind of abandoning everything I ever knew. And then um, I came home and that some after the summer, um, I think it was actually later. It was, might have been Christmas break. And my brother was home, who, as you know, was a theater major at University of Dallas and he um, and I were talking about, like, it just sucks because everyone wants us to pick a lane. Everybody wants us to just pick one thing to be. And he was being really heavily pushed uh, to be a doctor, right, when he first entered college. And for me, it was definitely to be, not like I was being pushed to be a teacher, but like, definitely pick something you're going to do and let's study up and do it. And we got to pick now, pick a lane. And we were just lamenting, like, why can't we get into this idea of the Renaissance man again. Like, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with being good at a lot of things? Like, why do we have to just specialize so much? And um, and then we sort of landed on this idea that maybe, maybe theater is one of those places where you actually can be a Renaissance person, where it requires you to have a little bit of a lot of different skills. Right? It requires you to be able to manage and be sometimes administrative, and it requires you to have that organizational side, but it also asks you to be wild and free and creative and to use your hands to build things and to paint things and to like go hunting for things that are so hard to find. And all of that was so attractive to me. And then throw on the research, the historical research and aesthetic research, and I was like, I'm in. I don't have to pick a lane. I'm in. And I was sort of just like sold on that as um, sort of a career choice early on. The flexibility of it. Uh, I mean, as I said, jokes on me because I did end up coming around to teaching. I mean, I think always at the end of the day, I was going to be a teacher. In fact, when I was, um, on my national tour, my boss was like, at one point, so I'm like, you know, you might want to just like tone it down with these guys. I think we were in Chicago, no, Philadelphia. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, I know you're like always kind of trying to teach somebody. Every city we go to, you want to teach somebody something. I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> Like, yeah, you do, you do, you do it every time. But these guys, they're not going to take too well to that. I was like, oh, I didn't even know. Like, I didn't realize I was doing it, but I just, I do, I do enjoy teaching. So, <laughs> I think those were like my first two moments. I yeah. think that uh, I think that teaching is actually the only um, theatrical pursuit you can uh, go for, where in the end you do actually get to do a little bit of everything, though. Like, you know, yes. even in theater, you have to pick a lane, even in, um, you know, if you decide to be, I mean, literally even the idea of theater versus film, like you have to pick theater or film. You have to learn something about one or the other thing. Are you in front of the camera or behind the camera? Then, then, you know, if you're behind the camera, then it's divided into a million more other options right and if you do sound most of your life they're not going to just be like great you're the lighting guy now right so <laughs> so but when well you're... it might happen but let's hope not rarely I mean, I think that's true but yeah. look at the field that i was really starting in which was props and that that's what drew me to it because props you can be one day doing a little bit of very small wiring as long as the electricians don't catch you. And you're doing some painting and you're doing some research and you're doing some furniture um, construction or repair. You're doing, you know, I mean, so, I mean, I think that that's what ended up, ended up working well for me with starting props. And that's where I got that idea about. But you're absolutely right. Um, being in education and academia really lends itself nicely to kind of constantly switching lanes and um and i think even within academia because some days you you feel like an academic and you're doing research and peer review journals and assessing your colleagues files and then the next day you're just trying to get paint to match like you're trying to find the right goal <laughs> to match you know right <laughs> crazy 
<laughs> yeah, you're calling three places in Long Island going, why don't you still carry this gold leaf? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Hey, couple of questions. You, in your story, you referred to your first summer stock. Where was that? Uh, so that was at Texas Shakespeare Festival, oh. which I loved. Kilgore College is sort of the home of the Texas Shakespeare Festival. They were actually just on Snap Judgment a couple weeks ago with Raymond Caldwell, the original artistic director who's since retired. Um, but it was on their campus, the home of the original drill team, just in case you weren't familiar. Meaning yeah. it was the first place that ever had a drill team? Like a kick line drill team, yeah. Oh. It used to be a pipeline for the Rockettes, too. I don't know oh. if it's still a... Texas to New York. Very direct. Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, sure. And then you mentioned you went on a national tour. Where did, What did you go on a national tour of? It was Door the Explorer Live Pirate Adventure. It was a hard pink contract, which I did not realize at the time was like sort of the penultimate, like, a, a very high standard of contract. I just, it was my first tour. It was my last tour. It was the best. We had a great time. And, um, I mean, it was it was crazy. It was five trucks for the tour, and we had this massive boat that, of course, Boots has to, like, do a somersault on the front of the bow and has to have all these trick things and it would ride itself out onto the stage and rock back and forth while it didn't. The five other characters were there. But I loved it. It had like some puppetry that props got to do and um these crazy different huge props like big rock and little rock had to be brought on stage and you're completely blind, kind of surfing on this thing. Like you could like push it out on the stage, jump on it, hit your mark and stop. <laughs> but you couldn't see where you were going. So it was like complete muscle memory in different venue after different venue. So it was great. And those friends from that tour are like family and friends to this day. Hmm. Yeah. Did yeah. you work props on that tour or were you performing in it? I worked props on that tour. Hmm. And it was really interesting uh, to me because there were some puppets that the actors operated and there were some puppets that props operated and you could tell that there had been like an extensive union discussion about who would operate which oh yeah and uh, yeah and uh, but I, I mean it was so much fun um like we did senior my first so I came on as the props assistant to the tour and it was one of these crazy like um, one of these crazy situations where had I not worked this job, I wouldn't have met the guy who put me on this job that I only did because he begged me to do because they needed someone there. And if I hadn't done that, this person wouldn't have known me so that when someone else fell out, I couldn't have gone to replace this person. You know, like all of these just sort of misconnections of someone else's have paid off well for me and had me end up on this show as a prop assistant. And then our lead props person left for a summer and I stepped up into her role. And I always laugh because one of the first times I did the lead prop track was at a small venue called Radio City Music Hall. <laughs> what is this life that we're living in? <laughs> But you were like, was this before or after you personally lived in New York City? This was after I had lived in New York City. You mean when you and I lived in the frozen Mexican food factory? <laughs> Is that what you tell me about your memory of this place where we lived? Because I have all sorts of recently I had a conversation on Facebook with some old roommates about a place where we lived. And they were like, I remember the place like this. And I was like, oh, I remember it like this. And so it's fascinating to me, like the different things like so to your point where you're like I got all these jobs from this random person who knew this random person you and I met when we were at University of Dallas together and then right after college you got a job at NYU and just because you're the kindest person in the world called me and we're like hey they're hiring get in your car and drive and I did 
drive up from Dallas to New York City directly <laughs> to move into a crazy warehouse with you. Um, but tell yeah. me what your experience of living there was, because mine is, you know, wild. But I want to know what you think. You know, we have really different, I think we had really different experiences. And I think part of it had to do with the way that we arrived. And I don't even, like, I was racking my, drink, my brain because the student was asking me, about this space exactly like how did i end up finding a place in new york like i don't remember and i look back on and i think oh my gosh i really must have outstayed my welcome on so many couches and it didn't even occur to me that it would be a problem people said come stay with me anytime and i took them to their word <laughs> i was like well, okay and i'll stay for two months now <laughs> I look back, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did this to people. But nonetheless, at some point I realized it was time for me to find my own place. And I and I don't know how I ended up. Someone knew someone who knew someone, right? And then they were like, this friend of ours is trying to sublet a room at this larger place. Um, and she was about to rent it to someone else. But if you want it, she'll meet each day at this time. I was like, I'm on it. And I go out there and... She shows me, and so like you'll remember, you go. There's like no markings that I recall <laughs> no. on the wall of this massive building at all. Just there's a door, just this door, and there. I don't even think there was a mailbox. Oh, but remember, across the street there was like, what do you call it? The mailbox that belongs to the U.S. Postal Service that's blue with the hump over the top, actually laid on its side. <laughs> right? Do you remember that? And I'll never forget. It's like etched on my brain the guy who would come and check it once once a week and he was like I have to open the door and lift it up because it was laying on its side which was so strange <laughs> anyway so you go up these stairs which by that time after living in New York going up multiple sets of winding tight stairs didn't seem odd but what seemed odd is when you look to the left and there's like a window to an open shaft where there's a hanging potted plant. <laughs> Happening here. And then you go up a little farther and they say, yeah, it's really, everybody here is really creative and inventive. Like, a bear, you see, that's where they keep their toilet paper. And you look up and there's just this massive pallet, which now sound, doesn't sound like a bad idea, but this massive pallet of toilet paper suspended above the entrance at the top of the stairs. And then you go in, and my room was just to the right. She showed me that room, and I was surprised there was. She, I, I don't know what I expected. I had, like, the most naive understanding of what it meant to, like, ha pay for my own housing. Right, so <laughs> they open the door, and then there's, like, a little fold-down desk and a couple of, you know, bare shelves like attached to the wall and then a loft above me that had a mattress. I think, I think it had a mattress and that was the whole room. I don't remember what we paid for it, but it wasn't a lot. And she's like, yeah, this is how much it is. And I thought that's literally how much it was. So then when like, I thought I must have lived there for a couple weeks to a month. And when, uh, when you came along and I think I, a couple of weeks after that, you were like, we said some, one of them had said something to me about paying money on the water bill or the electric bill. I was like, oh, no, no, I already paid my rent. And they just, like, I think were so shocked by my absolute opinion <laughs> on the fact that I had already paid that they just kind of walked away. And then you came up to me later and you're like, oh, you know, Jessica, you don't have to pay for water and power. Like, that's part of the thing. And I was like, really? No, no, no. She said... And I'm done. And like, really? And he's like, yeah, you do. And I was like, okay, all right. You know, in different Jesus. places, though, sometimes it is one and done, you know? And realistically, yeah. from the standpoint of the guy who was the leader of that apartment, he should have one and done to everybody. He should have been like, yeah. okay, you need to pay what your rent is plus 150 and then just use that to pay for all the random bills because there were so many yeah. random tiny little, and it was like, what do you need? 20 bucks now? Okay, here you go. 
Oh, man. You know, it's funny. You talk about your room like it was bare and insane. But realistically, I think your room had the most organization of any bedroom other than like that's right. The one guy who lived right off the entrance who had been living in the place as long as um, Josh, who owned the whole thing. Yeah. Well, I never met. I, I don't know who that is. What do you mean you don't know who that is? <laughs> you didn't meet I didn't Josh? I know there was a room. I know who Josh is, but I didn't know there was a room off the entrance downstairs. Oh, no, 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 no. Upstairs. When you went up the stairs, oh, you, yeah, yeah, you yeah. see the yeah. big mural, right? And then mm-hmm. there's the three bedrooms off of, like, the living room. And then there was one more bedroom sort of in the hallway yeah. before you get to yeah. the kitchen, right? Yeah. 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 And it was you and me and a guy whose name I can't remember right now. I'm really sorry. Who was a set designer who lived off the yep. of the living room. Yes. And for some reason was assisting William Ivy Long <laughs> at the time. Right. Was <laughs> definitely like, working on some serious high profile stuff while yeah. we were just sort of like schmoes working for NYU. That yeah. being said, not a bad gig. Uh, looking back on that gig it was like man why did i not just stay and continue to work for nyu that would have been a very good job (laughs) it was amazing wasn't it and and how funny now like i'm teaching like my students do this distinguished designer uh presentation as part of their coursework and in one of my introduction to design classes and (laughs) a couple of them had come in they're like we really want to present on this person i'm like really Okay, and I say really because I recognize the name from when we were at NYU, and then they do the presentation. I'm like, oh, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't realize that's who I was working with at the time. This is like the theme of my career. I didn't know who I was working with at the time, but it's probably better off that way. You know, I feel like that yeah. too. There's been a lot of people who, you know, either were famous when I met them or became famous later. And I was like, oh yeah, I know that guy. Uh, and then you're like, what? He's on a hit television show? Oh, great. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, or, I do. or like, uh, or like, wait, he was a Broadway director? Like Broadway, Broadway? And they're like, yeah, that's who that guy was. Yeah. Like, Man, I talked to him for like three months. I had no idea. Like, you know what I mean? Like, just crazy things. Um, I know. And, uh, it, but it's, I think it's, it's good. From my point of view, I like dealing with the everyday humans that are going to do theater projects, um, you know, like they're everyday humans because they are. And because realistically, like, we're all just trying to, um, put together something beautiful, right? And yeah. so why muck it up by making this person feel either uncomfortable and also like uh, certainly in NYU and most of, I think, our, the jobs that you and I have had going forward is, you know, our job has a lot to do with making the people that we work with feel comfortable. And once they're comfortable, they're able to do their work. Like, I feel like that for a stage manager, like my job was to make sure all the crazy stuff that people were like, I, how do you even do that gets done. And so that they can just quietly work on the script and make sure that the, characters that they build are exactly right and then that way they do their thing i do my thing i make sure everybody feels good and warm inside and then uh and that's how i feel about improv too like since i started teaching improv like my whole job is like to make everyone feel comfortable so that they can do the art right i don't know yeah absolutely no i think absolutely i mean i think you put on something that um that Kevin, my brother, who we both know, and I have talked about for a long time, which is that at the core of it, it's as if everyone already has what their job is going to be in life, but then they've got to go and have a career, right? And so, like, to your point, yes, I think both of us have this job that that we, that for my part, I love. It's my favorite thing, spreading people at ease being able to gauge the room and sort of tend to those ebbs and flows. And that's always going to be my job, no matter what I do, right? But it happens to fit what I do really well. It doesn't mean that I do this job or that job. I'll always do it. But then the, the career I chose, I supposed to my work there. But you know what I mean. It's like there's totally. some, 
thing about like, and it's nice that it's transitional, right? It's hard to put on a resume though, I think. Yeah. Well, you know, here's the other thing between the idea of, I know what you mean now when you say everyone's got a job that they are good at and then they have to find a career. Like, like I get what you're saying. Like my, in that scenario, in that example, my job would be like taking care and making everyone feel calm. Like I said, that's what I like to do, but I do it in lots of different capacities, you know, depending on whatever the job that somebody wants to pay me to do. But what I was thinking when, before you explained yourself was the idea that, you know, just because society has decided these jobs are the ones that make a lot of money and these are the ones that don't doesn't mean that you have to choose something that makes money to like have or or if you'd like to great but that doesn't take away who you are and what your like internal like who you are job is like I have this theory especially because of improv um because like so Improv is a thing that you have to teach adults because um, when they were kids, they knew how to play. But then all the hormones and like realization that like someone's going to judge you appears in your life. And then you live through that for a bunch. And then you're an adult and you have to deal with all that. Plus like paying for things and making sure that you don't die. And so there's a lot of pressure and you have to be like, hey, let's forget like how life is terrible. And like, just be like, ooh, yeah, fun times, you know, and yeah. And so I want to bring people back to their childhood selves because I believe that your childhood self is um, is a clue into who you need to be as an adult. And if you're ever like, oh, man, I just don't know what I want to do or I just what's my what's the right path? Think about yourself as a child. And if you can't remember what you did as a child, ask the people that were around you. They'll tell you what you liked what you wanted to do, how you wanted to spend your time. And those clues are things that you can use to build toward any job that you get, right? So if it's like, oh man, you were always playing with Legos. Like you would take those things apart and put them together. Great. Have you thought about working at a, at a job in a warehouse maybe where you put things together? Like something where, or, or like, have you thought about making jewelry that puts things together? You know, like little things that you can give yourself a clue of to lead to who you are. So um, I'm totally down with this idea of like, we are who we naturally are and like that leading to career. But I also think like as children, we are clues to ourselves. That's the other reason too, why like parents are always trying to control their children when they get older. Cause they're like, I know what you want. But <laughs> the terrible part is the parents who are the ones who have literally witnessed it the whole time who could probably tell that person, hey, by the way, you love this the most. They're never going to hear it from them. Right. Yeah. They have to f- remember or hear it from somebody else, like a cousin who's like, oh, yeah, you were always into puppets. And you're like, I like puppets. Maybe I do like. <laughs> um, and then they're like, yeah, Jimmy Henson, get out there, you know, whatever it might be. Um <laughs> People, you know, to find who you are, sometimes you have to mine the experiences that you've had. Um, to that end, I'd love to hear more about. So, like, you tell me more about your interest in props. This is definitely where I met you. This is definitely jobs that I've seen you have. And yeah. um, I love it. I love how you can create these things. I do not have this skill. So um, whenever I see people make things and props, I'm always like, oh my God, it's amazing. How did you get into creating these little treasures and like making them for plays? Well, I, I'm, I met this person on my boss's bed, right, at a party. What? And so they... <laughs> this they, salacious I mean, it's, story. Goodness, so again. <laughs> but we, they, I, I think that, I don't know if it's still true, but at the time it was always hard to fill the prop shop. And um, they needed one more person for their prop shop. And it was like, look, it was, we all know how this sort of hiring season goes for summer stuff. It was April. And they hadn't hired yet. And they were like, yeah, yeah, just send them as your resume on Monday. And uh, I was like, really? Okay. I'm going to write a resume tonight. So I, like, real quick tried to write up a resume. I wish I still had that. I think I had it on red paper, you know? Oh. I was going to Texas. And so 
I wanted it to be either red, white, too boring, or blue, and red, red, the best. <laughs> this is a poor choice. Anyone listening, red is not good for your resume paper. But I sent that out, and, and they I don't know, maybe it is. hired <laughs> I, they hired me, and I mm-hmm. had no idea what I was getting into. I remember there was this one person at our school who had worked professionally, and I just was constantly asking, like, what do you think I'm going to have to do? What am I going to do? Why do they think I can do this? I have zero experience in this. And then getting there and realizing it was literally, in some ways, doing this upper level, but nonetheless, arts and crafts all day. Yeah. I'm in. I'm so in. And I loved it. And um, I didn't know how to use one power tool before I went, uh, which I'm not sure they were aware of. And um, I, I had a friend who would like, who I like confessed on a break, like, I don't know how to use these power tools and I don't want anyone to find out because I think that they'll fire me. He's like, don't worry, I'll find a way to show you each of them so no one knows what's happening. (laughs) And it was like insane because what's the next project that I get is to cut out these, all these scrolling, like, like keyhole work with the jigsaw, these standing keyhole candelabra. It was unbelievable. Oh <laughs> I was like, okay, are you? Well, everyone, we should go on break. And then everyone would go on break. And my friend would come show me how to use the jigsaw. And now I've got to do the thing that is like challenging to do for an experienced jigsaw person. But it turned out great. Anyway, so I ran to the fair and just loving it. Because like what we did all day is just like take turns, putting cassette tapes in the stereo and laughing when my friend Joanna put her whole foot in a gallon of paint by accident and just like I don't know it was like the most delicious Lord of the Flies summer over in that prop shop and we were like a little bit removed from everyone and and we got to just make beautiful things and then watch them get paraded across the stage and um you know it, it was just I immediately fell in love with props partly because of that variety Right, but also because they just seemed like they were the perfect balance of being kind of taking some of the attention, but also none of the responsibility of the attention. Do you know what I mean? Totally. Like it wasn't standing on stage and giving a monologue, but it was definitely feeling appreciated for the craft you were doing. And I worked for them, I think, three different summers, not consecutively, and. And I loved it each summer, and, and every summer it was always something different. That's the other thing with props. Like, sure, you're going to make a lot of a couple of typical things, but there's always something surprising that you can kind of throw yourself into and just get into that zone. And, and I loved it. Absolutely loved it. And then from there, I felt like, okay, well, what's the next step? I wanted to go to graduate school. I couldn't really tell anyone at the time why I wanted to go to graduate school. Um but I wanted to go to graduate school and there was only one graduate school at the time that had props as a graduate degree. I was like, well, that doesn't seem like a good bet, you know, to, so I should probably open up my options. And so scenery seemed like the best thing to do. And actually I ended up going to West Virginia university because of, um, my relationship with Peggy McCowan at Texas Shakespeare Festival prior. And I looked at a few different places. I loved Brandeis and almost went there and um, talked to Purdue and almost went there. But West Virginia University and already knowing Peggy felt like home already. And so I ended up there. And as we were talking, she's like, so I don't understand really why I'm, you know, she's happy to support me, but she was like, why are you doing scenery? I know you have this props background, but you also have like all of this sewing skill. And I know you've done costume design. I was like, Oh, well, I don't want to (laughs) sew. And she said, again, jokes on me because I actually do like to sew. But at the time I was like, I don't want to sew. And she's like, Oh, well, good news. You don't necessarily have to sew if you're a costume designer, but I hadn't, ever experienced that right like I thought my experience with theater had been if you're a designer you better be able to make the thing you're designing or it's not going to get done and so I I just thought that and so she was so kind and supportive and allowed me to sort of pursue both while I was there which was really great 
Um, oh. Yeah. And then I always forget this. And I was just talking to my husband about it the other night because he had assumed that I just jumped from success to success to success. But I forgot that after I finished grad school, I don't, the summer after grad school, I did a show in Germany and then um, I assistant designed in Germany and then came back to Texas Shakespeare Festival another summer and um, and then went back to uh, my place in West Virginia, ended up, I thought it was done for the summer, but my friend was like, no, we need someone to help us out with props at West Virginia Public Theater. And so like, really? Because I'm done for the summer. And they're like, no, we really need someone. Okay, great. I'm here. Let's do it. So did another stint of summer stock there unexpectedly, and which is where I met um, Danny Tonello, who then sort of held on. But I got to know him, and he's like, well, what do you want to do next? And I just like always, and you know how it is, you make up these sort of plans. I was like, well, I really want to go on tour. I think that would be great. And um, But I don't know how to do that. And I had no idea how you get on a tour. Well, it turns out that conversation was how you got on a tour. So I leave that um, that summer sock, and it's now fall, and it's Christmas and all of that. And I didn't work in theater that whole time. I was working at Bank of America Call Center, or I was working at um, the Survey Call Center. Because to me, I was just like, I've got to pay my bills. And the theater will happen when it's time. But for now, this is what I'm doing. And which Doug was like, wait a minute. So you had a period when you weren't doing theater or college? I'm like, yeah, everybody has that. Everybody <laughs> yeah. has that. Yeah. Like the, the theater requires so much luck. I mean, every, talent matters, but luck sort of rules the day, in my opinion. Well, and being kind and thoughtful to people. Because if you're not that, forget it. No one's going to call you back. There's too many other people in line behind you with talent. Well, also, so, there's, like, just sometimes there isn't anything to do. You know what I mean? Right. Like, occasionally, the, all the jobs have been given up. It's not like an endless amount of jobs available for all people who are interested all the time. Like, That's you know, right. and also, we're living our regular lives as well, right? It's not like... All, everything is all theater like we're probably like dating and dealing with roommates and then like there's other things that we have to deal with in just our personal lives with friends that like changes this vibe and that and makes you move out and oh now I have to move to another city and well I don't know anyone in the theater scene there so like when people yeah. act like it's even possible to consistently work all the time it's like yeah you could, but you'd really have to be full time into just focusing on your work and have the ability to just go wherever, anytime. Like, and if you don't right. have that freedom, well, then you're going to have some downtime because that's life, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Like when you call your friend and say, there's a stage management job and I've got a place for you to live, but you have to be here by Monday. <laughs> Oh my God! That was such I still a feel thing. like I can't believe I did that to you. Well, I look back and I'm like, you know, what was I doing to it, poor Amy, who just like packed up her whole life? It was the down. best thing ever, though. Are you kidding me? Mm. I mean, so many things in my life wouldn't have happened had I not made that first decision. Even like my dad fully accepting that I was an adult happened yeah. when we got to that blank door <laughs> on the side of the warehouse and he was like wait what this is where you live and I was like yep this is it he was like I'm not leaving you here and I was like no no it'll be fine and like he walks in and like you said you go up the rickety stairs and you're like and he's like are we about to be murdered and I was like maybe but it'll be fun and then we get in there and it's like and it's like friends where like you walk through this door and you're like surely this apartment is tiny and then you're like how are there 47 rooms and also 47 roommates like unbelievable yeah I mean it was the coolest place it was great it was a great opportunity to like first place to live in New York City it was 
very out of the way and forced you to take a bus and a train to get anywhere near Manhattan. That's right. But I feel like that's a learning experience to have to do that. And there were enough of us, like there were so many people in that house at all times. Like we were never alone. You were never alone. You know what I mean? Like you were safe because down the hall, there were like seven people doing a monologue class and like, and like a (laughs) Japanese director in residence in the basement and like a bowling league. And you're like, does this room still belong to us? And they're like, shh, be quiet. They're, they're putting, watching 2001 for a class. You're like, what? Like everything was insane. You know, like every day I'd wake up and my bagels would be being eaten by the actors that had arrived for rehearsal. And they're like in the kitchen, like, oh, hey, I'm like, why, why? Why are you eating my stuff? But that's just the way it was. It was an active space, right? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was yeah. a great, great, great first apartment. But, you know, you take those chances. And if you yeah. don't have, that's why when you get older, there are more times when you're not doing it because you can't take those huge cha- uh, chances like you did when you were that's younger. Right. Like if somebody yeah. called me right now and said, hey, come do this job, I'd be like, Okay, well, thanks. That's nice. But no, I'm doing this now. Right? Like, yeah. And it's, I just happened to be able to do it, you know, right at that moment. And I thankfully had a really nice roommate who was very okay with the fact that I took off. And Yeah. uh, yeah. And what an amazing experience. So, you, so you were doing all sorts of stuff, doing all sorts of tours and stuff, but staying mostly with costumes and props. How did you get to academia? Well, so I was in Los Angeles with Dora, kicking out the number line. I, think it, I don't know why, but it's like cinematic in my head. Like I was literally, we had just laid the Marley, which we always laid pretty much right before lunch. Um the carts would go to lunch, so we'd have the floor, and we'd lay out the Marley, get it all down, and then we had to set up the number line, right? And um, I'm kicking out the number line to tape it down, and in my head, I'm going, I'm not sure how many more times I can kick this number line out. <laughs> now, at the same time, I'm having the time of my life in L.A. Like, we are living it up on per diem loving just sort of rolling around LA wherever we want to. We're at the Kodak Theater. I mean, nothing was wrong except that it was always the same. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so right as I'm kicking that out, Peggy McCowan calls me again. Man, I owe Peggy McCowan the same to notice just what I'm realizing. I'm kicking up the number line. Peggy McCowan calls me and says, hey, by the way, I know that when you're in grad school, you said one day you wanted to um, – teach at a college or university and there's this university right now who needs to hire someone right away so this might be your way in and they're looking for a set design uh professor and i think you have a really good chance here and so i call up this is at university of north carolina wilmington i don't remember how it happened but this was like it was the beginning of the school year already when they called me and they needed someone like the next day i was like well i think we have to give two weeks notice like that's going to be a required thing you can't have me for two weeks no matter how we feel about each other you know but they were like no we need you like tomorrow so i don't know how i mean now that i'm in academia i'm going how does that happen that you lose (laughs) your faculty member for classes who are that are already enrolled and like right at the start of the year, but it had happened. I mean, there's lots of reasons, but I just don't remember. So she called and, and it just was perfect timing because I just had that thought, like, I don't know how many more times I can do this. And it felt like, oh, okay, well, this seems like exactly what I'm supposed to do now. And um, when I think I had done in grad school a little bit of math to realize, not financial math, but just sort of life math to go, you know, it is still important to me to one day find someone that I can have kids with and settle down in one place. I mean, I love this theater thing and traveling all the time. That also is going to be important to me. And I always kind of learned by watching the people around me. And what I saw was that my faculty 
who uh, were still active with their careers were able to have these settled lives um, and kids and families. And I thought, oh, that might be the perfect mix. When I remembered that I did want to be a teacher at some point. <laughs> and it seemed like, even though I forgot about the fact that I said I don't want to be a teacher. Um, and so it just felt like the perfect kind of marriage of all the things I was interested in. And then that call came at exactly the right moment. I sent my information over and it was enough for them to hire me as a visiting professor. And at the time, that sounded great to me. That's all that I needed was like a foot in the door, which has always been like sort of my approach. All I need is a foot in the door and then I'll figure out what to do after that. Exactly. But I mean, to, to your point, I had no sort of attachment. You know, I had a cat who was pretty amenable to moving wherever. Um, and so I basically went into my company manager's office, like I think two days later. I mean, it all happened over a series of phone calls in a couple of days. It was insane. And I went and I said, I, this is, I hate to do this to you, but I'm going to have to leave the tour in two weeks. I think I know someone who can replace me. So that's good news. Um, but yeah, I gotta go. And they were shocked. None of them knew I had a graduate degree. They all, most of them had bachelors and they were like, wait a minute, we didn't know what. And so they were just all shocked at this, what seemed to them this abrupt left turn, but to me just seems like, ah, there we're yielding to traffic now, you know? And, um, and so I left tour went to West Virginia, packed up all of my belongings and moved down to Wilmington into an apartment I had rented online um, and uh, moved everything in and started teaching like the next day. Um, so I was like writing syllabi while I was on the bus on tour in anticipation of landing. I got there, I think, on like Labor Day which they had off, and so someone met me at the campus on Labor Day and showed me the building, so I knew where to go for class the next day, and then I just, like, landed and started, and, and I loved it immediately, because I could design and teach at the same time, and, um, and so I was there for a year. It was a visiting position. It wasn't a permanent position, and in that time, I just started... I mean, you realize pretty quickly in theater that you've always ha always have to have a mind towards what's coming after, right? Like, what's after curtain call? What's after? <laughs> and so I, in, like, basically got there, started teaching my first set of classes, and then a month later was already applying for what I would do the following year, and um, ended up finding the listing at Eckerd, and went to their extensive interview process, which is just so wonderful for helping you understand the community here and also um, for them to really understand who you are, right? And and I remember uh, once I had arrived thinking, oh, no, they are going to think that I copied their mission statement and my teaching philosophy because our my approach and my thoughts about teaching and experiential learning and sort of embracing every individual learning and meeting them where they are is what Eckert's all about. And so I was so worried they would just sort of like reject me thinking that I was not being authentic. But I mean, 14 years later, it's worked out. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I has become like the perfect home for me because again I get to do all these different types of things and the people in the situation change every year so it's almost like touring without leaving home you know yeah I love that you were able to find a place to do all the different fun theater jobs that you like doing and that you're good at doing, but you also got to have the settled life with partner and kids that, you know, you were craving at the time. I find that, yeah. you know, like you said, a lot of times if you're in theater, that's the thing you're not going to get, 
you know, if you want to, if you want to focus on this, making this your career, you're on the road constantly and you're just going everywhere. And, you know, maybe some people listening to this are like, that sounds great. Great. Do it. Because at a certain point, some people who are doing it are going to be like, yeah, I need to settle down. So get in there, get those jobs. Like if you like it, do it because there's plenty of it. Maybe not today, but, um, but there will be. And forever more um there's always tours and uh and traveling and whatnot it's just i feel like right now everybody who's got had to go through covid now knows what side of the fence they're on whether they're like a, i want to be on tour person <laughs> or i want to be settled and at home like some people who are never yeah. settled are like wow i've never been in my apartment so long it's nice let's do it and some people are like get me out of this apartment i'm putting yeah. everything i own in a storage unit and getting in an rv and that's it yes you know yeah so, yeah it's great that you found a good spot and I love the idea that you were like afraid they weren't going to hire you because you guys were so similar. They were probably like, oh, my God, we hit the jackpot. We think right. the same way. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. Plus, I mean, I don't know that I've known a single person ever that didn't enjoy you. Like everywhere I've ever worked with you, everyone's always like, oh, Jessica's so great. It's so wonderful. I mean, I don't think I ever heard a negative word about you in, amongst the 4,000 roommates of our our, um, uh, of our Brooklyn apartment. So, you know, even after Which you left. Which is shocking since I told them I wasn't going to pay water and power, right? Well, you know, <laughs> they just found somebody else, one of the other randos to do it. They're like, oh, uh, hey, Joe, you owe an extra 50 bucks a month. And he's like, okay, here you go. Um, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I mean, who knows? Who knows what anybody was? We could have been in there with like Paris Hilton and a bunch of millionaires. We wouldn't have known. I mean, and, and, I mean, it is not lost on me how lucky I am to have found this institution, this sort of part of the country and my friends and my spouse and, you know, all of the things that have happened to me to St. Petersburg. I mean, because I, of my position at Eckerd, it's, it's sort of like this, I mean, the ethos towards the students is to say, what do you want to do? And what's your plan? We support you. Right? Like, even if it's some crazy harebrained idea, it's like, oh, how do you imagine doing it? Great. Let's try it. And I feel like there's that same support with faculty and so like as far as my personal research I can you know for a while was all completely into doing puppets and learning about this very tiny little sliver of puppet history like in depth and just going so deep on Turkish Karagon shadow puppetry and trying to sort of modernize a process for creating that without animal hides and and the college was like that sounds interesting you run with that yeah, like how amazing is that? And it is each course that you just feel so passionate and excited about is amazing. Um, it also means that now, because I feel like I've been doing so much leash and I've been able to do so many things that now I'm going, huh, I wonder what's next. I have kind of been, hmm, what is next? And I'm like literally at this point in my career where I'm, um, going, I, I'm not sure what the next step is. I'm really happy where I am. I can do exactly what I'm doing for forever, but I know that I like to keep sort of moving as far as my interests go, but I'm between things right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm. you know, for that little extra bit of outside of designing and teaching, what's that going to be? <laughs> or maybe I could just do my job and and nothing else I don't know (laughs) well you know what's interesting and you know I was going to ask you about what your artistic jam was and it seems like this is it so the the idea of looking for the next thing is not crazy and especially right now I feel like art and theater and the way that we're performing stuff is it's in a renaissance where the way that we do it and the way that we look at it is going to be different. You know, I mean, we've both 
realize that we have so many other possible ways of performing that are not just either on stage or on film. Like now there's so many other possibilities to do it and to connect with people. And the idea of it doesn't have to be like you're on stage at this major event with all these highfalutin people, you do a Zoom play reading and maybe you get a hundred people, but you get this super tight connection between these hundred people and you get this amazing experience, you know, like there's a lot of different ways to go about it. Like my thought, like as a only vague means of advice would be to like hang out and see what of the new world interests you because the way that it works is going to be different. And the way that like when Broadway comes back, there's got to be something about the business model that's got to run differently because of what happened, because of the money lost, because of, because of like how it works now. So all sorts of theater business models are going to have to change. Different ways we consume things are going to change. You know, like we're all a lot more used to watching full length plays on our laptop than we used to be. And like, yeah. you know, the opportunities for people are everywhere you know it it doesn't have to be the guy who happened to audition best who lives in the town no if it's an online play you can have one guy from canada and another guy from india and another guy from new zealand all in the same show working together as long as they get up at the same time you know they (laughs) they can do this project and the idea of that is like wow, these people can work together, can connect in ways that they could not before. So between that and the new way that every sort of like big industry has to reinvent themselves, like Hollywood has to reinvent themselves, film across the country is going to reinvent itself. And then theater, like just how theater runs, the business of it, and how it attracts audience and does it connect with them both on stage and online maybe yes all the things right we are in a renaissance of the way art we've also spent all this time at home so now we know how much art means to us how many things we care about how many more books has everyone read how many more tv shows have we consumed how many more like movies have we watched and now it's like because of all this stuff that I've looked at, now I really know what I like. And now I I'm, I know more closely what I'd be interested in working on. And I don't know, all the changes, I think, open up many doors. But those doors might be, you know, a little further in the future. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I mean, we uh, did a virtual theater piece um, in at the very – we had um, – but everyone had an unusual term this fall, right? And our approach to it and the way that the campus tried to stay safe was to have um, students return in a phase return, which meant they completely sort of chunked our traditional academic calendar. And instead of students taking four classes over the span of 14 weeks, they took one class for three and a half weeks, a second class for three and a half weeks, and then two classes for seven weeks so that they could bring back just the first year, then the sophomores, and then the juniors and seniors just to try to help keep campus safe. And it worked. You know, it was a really successful measure that they did. It meant, though, though that I was teaching theater production in a three-and-a-half-week block without being able, with everyone remote, because I had no first years in my class and um, no, usually theater production is supporting a live performance on stage. It's all the design and tech elements. It's the experience. It's almost like, you know, theater lab, right? Where you're doing all the experience, experiential elements of the crews and things like that. And so how do you teach that remotely? Well, um, my friend Jen Rapp and I created a play over the summer because we're, I was like, all right, nothing I'm seeing here feels like something that I can survive three and a half intense weeks of doing. So let's just throw it all out. And I called up Jen Rapp, who is a miracle on this planet, amazing director and choreographer. And aside from the talent, what makes her amazing is just her vulnerable human soul that she shares with everyone so selflessly. And I just called her 
And I said, I want to just try something completely outside the box, do a virtual show, but just create it ourselves, figure out what we love and what the story is, and then just try it. And if it's completely weird and horrible, I don't care because it will have been the experience of creating something. And that's what the class will be. And without hesitation, she goes, yeah, I want to do that. And so we like started sort of sharing what we were reading, what we were interested in. And we ended up um, creating a really loose adaptation of this book that I just adored. I actually went outside during a tornado to go get it from the front porch. Um, it's by Erin Morgenstern, and it's called The Starless Sea. So fantastic, the whole text. <laughs> and so there's one, there's like three or four different threads of stories in there. We pulled one of the stories and threaded it and told and retold um, her real love affair to storytelling through the voices of the, this Parliament of Owls. And we just had this fantastic time uh, creating this adaptation for a script. And then figuring out how to do that virtually and then bringing the students in. And everything had to be this gut instinct reaction because there was no time to really spend too much deliberation. Because three and a half weeks and you, we had to send things over to be edited, um, all the recordings to be edited in two and a half weeks. And, you know, you lose a couple of days just to class administration. So we had two weeks um, to create this piece, right? And we had people from Spain to Alaska. I mean, to your good point, people could be anywhere. And it was intense and hard. And one of my favorite things I've done in my whole life, the creation process was intimate because we're in each other's faces all day over Zoom. And we needed each other desperately, not just emotionally because of what we were going through. It was always there in the room with us, but we never spoke about it. We needed each other to do the show, you know, and so it was highly collective. And and then we put it on, and, and, and it was so exciting to have people come and see it. But as I was doing press, the question kept coming up, like, you know, do you think this will last past the pandemic? And I kept saying, well, I really hope so, because this is, you know, some people will never see live theater. Some people can't afford a babysitter, let alone the ticket. And so we have hit upon a way to sort of democratize the delivery of this very special thing that we do. Why would we leave that behind? I mean, I, I really hope we hold on to it in some ways. And I also want a little bit of our traditional theater back as well. I want it all. Why can't we have it all? I think we I can. Think let's do it. I think yeah. we definitely can. Yeah. All right. Final so. question for you. What advice do you have for, you know, theater artists like yourself who have so many interests and want to do it all? But, you know, like, how do you navigate your path? What's the what's the move? I think there's a danger in trying to manage the path too much. I think just being open to possibility is really like um, a wonderful place to sort of live, like just riding the crest of the wave and seeing where it takes you. And then, I mean, obviously you have to work hard and be kind to everyone, every single person, not just the people in charge, um, not just because you might need someone one day, but because the process is so much better when you do that and your life becomes so much better when you do that. But I think, as we talked about, just being willing to jump and and letting go of that worry that you might not be good enough or might not have the skills or might not have whatever it is you think that you're lacking in, why don't you just let someone else make that decision and jump for it? Because you might only get that chance once, you know? I mean, certainly you can live without that worry that if you miss out, you know, I don't want to build this worry that if you miss out on a chance, that's the last one, it's never coming around again. I think there are multiple chances. So not just one, but take advantage of everything. And especially if you are in a situation where you can jump and just take any opportunity, no matter where it is, 
then do that while you can because life does change. And um, there may come a point where you can't jump as easily. Mm. Good thoughts. Thank you so much, Jessica, for being on the podcast. I'm really glad that I got to talk to you and to reflect upon your amazing and lovely creative career. Thanks for having me. This is, um, you know, I would just spend hours with you anytime chatting, but I'm honored to be on your podcast and um, I can't wait to hear it come out. Yay. Thanks for listening to Yes But Why Podcast. Check out all our episodes on yesbutwhypodcast.com or check out all the content on our network, HC Universal, at hcuniversalnetwork.com. <laughs>